Welcome to the Focus on Why podcast. I'm Amy Rowlandson and I ask my guests one simple question, why? Focusing on the importance of why, I share with you the relatable, uplifting and inspiring conversations I have with people from all walks of life. This podcast will encourage you to focus on your why to enable and empower you to achieve the success you desire. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why. Before we get started, are you thinking of creating a podcast or are you a podcast host already? As a podcast strategist, I can help you to launch or relaunch a purposeful and profitable podcast, which will inspire, entertain and educate a global audience. Simply book in a one-to-one call with me right now via the Calendly link in the show notes and together we'll focus on the purpose of your podcast. Today on Focus on Why, I am joined by Katrine Horn. Hello and welcome. Hello, Amy. Thank you so much. And where are you joining us from? I live in the south of France. So, uh, yeah, I'm joining you from the south of France. That's the wonders of uh, technology, internet, isn't it? It really is. And tell me, how did you hear about Focus on Why originally? What, What was the lead in there? Can you remember? Yes, I was looking around for something inspiring to listen to. And then I happened on focus on why. And I thought, oh, what can that be about? Why? Why what? And so I started listening in to some wonderfully inspiring people, as are you. And so uh, I think I got in touch with you to tell you that, if I remember rightly. And it sort of it sort of uh, snowballed from there. That's wonderful. And thank you so much for coming on the show. Let's dive into what it is that you're doing at the moment. Right. I'm a life coach. So (laughs) living in the south of France is just by choice, really. I don't have to be here. And I'm a life coach. Well, that is really part of my story about the why. So it's a story that begins very far from, from the south of France because I was born in Denmark. And I got the crazy idea when I was very young that I wanted to play the harp. And there's not a lot of harp playing going on in the north of Denmark. But um, I somehow managed to get hold of a teacher and a harp. And then I decided I wanted to go uh, to music college in London. So how crazy was that? And everybody pointed it out to me that that was just not realistic, right? You know, how people so well-meaning, they try to prevent you from making terrible mistakes, like emigrating to a country where you don't really speak the language or know anybody. But um, I did it anyway. And that really, that was such a powerful decision for me because it got me on my trajectory of my life. So I sort of happened upon the idea when I was very young that feeling fear was a normal thing. So if I was willing to feel the fear and do it anyway, well then there was really no end to what I could do. And so I left Denmark, I arrived in Harwich, I took the train down to London, I booked a hotel for one week and I went to audition at the Guildhall School of Music and Drama. Um, I got in, so that was a big surprise. I thought, wow, so everybody is telling me that what I want is not possible, but lo and behold, it is. And then I went and got a job in Freeman Hardy and Willis on Oxford Street back in the day. And I also found some lodgings in North London. So um, that all happened in the space of a few days. And I just felt on top of the world because I've been told that you couldn't do these things and I just did them, you know? So that was such a powerful start, if I can say so, to my adult life. And what strikes me is that the you're incredibly resourceful and that you have a clarity decision-making that just is. It's it, There's no self-doubt or anything you had that ability to just go with what you felt that was a long time ago and yet there wasn't a huge amount of personal development at that time so how did you have this clarity and self-belief the clarity came from feeling the fear 
So I was somehow able to separate the feeling of fear and just look at it and have it be there. So not making feeling fear a problem, not making feeling fear a sign that it was wrong. So I think that was really what allowed me to do that. But the self-doubt was there, right? I was willing to doubt myself. I was thinking, maybe it's not possible. Maybe it is possible. Let me find out. Do you see what I mean? So I made the decisions just based on my desires. I chose not to listen too much to other people, right? Of course, they will influence you. But I just, I just had this, this idea that I had nothing to lose, right? Let me go and try. And I think as we get older, like now I'm 56, and I've got so much more to lose, if you see what I mean. And I'm just always making sure that this idea that I've got something to lose doesn't prevent me from going after my dreams. And I'm just wondering, because being a life coach, you're obviously very aware of processes and strategies and and how to apply decision making. Were you like that in that in that moment? Or are you looking at it from the lens of today? Yeah, I'm very much looking at it from the lens of today, because at the time, Obviously, as you said, there was no sort of self-development. There was not a lot of advice. Even I would risk so much as to say that people pretty much did what was expected of them. Like they stayed in their environments. They stayed in their, where they were born. Like there was not a lot of, like today, young people travel a lot. And I think, I mean, that's such a good thing because the more you travel, the more things you see, right? And the more you learn about yourself. And um, I don't remember your question, but no, I, I, I wasn't aware of any process and it's only in hindsight. And as my fellow countryman Kierkegaard said, uh, uh, you only understand life um, backwards, but it must be lived forwards. So if we trust ourselves to keep moving forwards, then we will end up by understanding Right. But we must take those steps to move forward. So I think if we stay stuck, well, then we don't really get to understand all of who we are. So having been that inc incredibly resourceful and fearless youngster, how has that taken you to now being a, an experienced life coach? <laughs> That's such a good question. Well, uh, I formed another crazy idea, which was to emigrate to France to go to music college in Paris. So I did that without speaking a word of French. So that was pretty scary. But I don't think that was the scariest thing I've ever done. The scariest thing I've ever done was to put on a one woman show in Avignon here in the south of France. That was really scary, but that's got nothing to do with it. Um, why am I a life coach? It is because at some point in my life, I became a school teacher. And having been in classical music all my life, thinking that everybody was reading Charlotte Bronte and listening to Brahms, I suddenly discovered that there's a whole, uh, a whole population, like tons of different kinds of people that I didn't know. And so I met their children at school, which was fabulous. And then I met the parents. And when, as a teacher, you try to, to, to encourage confidence, self-confidence, and a spirit of courage and, and acceptance of themselves, sometimes you would leave these children with their families for the weekend, and they would be pulled all apart. And I thought, well, why do parents do that to their children? Like, we're building up their confidence. They come back to us, and then... They've lost their confidence. So I thought, let me get to work on the parents because my idea is that happy parents have happy children. So I started counseling parents and then I started educating myself more and more, um, getting certified in life coaching. And I thought, actually, I can be so much more useful as a coach than as a teacher. So that was really how I 
not only discovered life coaching, but became a life coach. That's amazing. And what I'm hearing is the, the, the mixture of words that you've just used to describe the situation, you, you spoke about self-confidence, you spoke about courage and, and acceptance and trust and that spirit of self. And I'm just wondering, are they values that you hold or is, is that there a coincidence that you've chosen to use those words to describe that? Well, they're not a coincidence because it's what I help my clients with, right? But um, they're not particularly values of mine. I would say that freedom and beauty are my biggest values. I think that there's healing and beauty. And um, we all need confidence. We all need somebody to believe in us. We all need to believe in ourselves. So I think that is just a given, really. So tell me about freedom and beauty, because I, I love the concept of those, particularly with purpose as well as a filter. Mm, yeah, how gorgeous is that? So I, when I was young, I thought that freedom, it was the freedom to travel, the freedom to live anywhere, it was the freedom to explore and blah, blah, blah. But with age, I've really come to realize that freedom to me, what is so essential is that I'm free from my emotions. Meaning that, of course I'm human, we all are, but the more I'm able to separate my emotions so that they don't have, so they don't run my life, if you see what I mean, the freer I feel. If I'm willing to feel the fear, as I told you about earlier, if I'm willing to feel that fear, then it's no longer holding me captive then I'm free. I'm free to decide with my intellect instead of being only guided by my emotions. Not that I, I mean, we need emotions, obviously, and they are useful to guide us, but let's not only be guided by emotional reactions that we don't fully understand. Don't know whether you agree with that. I, I love it. And the freedom I often speak about in terms of it comes with something else. And a lot of people have freedom and, and you've brought freedom and beauty here. And I, I want to, to talk about the, you've spoken about the freedom of emotions, but in terms of what the beauty element is in connection with the freedom, it, are they two separate things for you or are they entwined? Well, this has been quite recent to me, but beauty has only been a value of mine for, for perhaps three years because I was sort of centering myself on beauty. I was thinking beauty, oh, that's so frivolous, Katrina. Now you can't possibly uh, give in to something like completely superficial like that. But when you think about it, beauty is anything but superficial. So I gave myself permission to really live for beauty. Like I think there is power in beauty and as long as I was denying myself the beauty my soul was really craving, I was always coming up against this self-criticism when I would long for beauty. Like I would think, oh, that's such a luxury, Katrina, luxury, that's so depraved. Like that is so superficial, you know, let's move over here to serious stuff. So I think the freedom is linked to beauty in the sense that I'm free to choose whatever I want, even if to some people it seems completely frivolous. Also, beauty, well, I've got the freedom to choose what kind, what, what is beautiful to me. And I don't even have to argue with you about that because something can be beautiful to me and not to you. And that's just beautiful in and of itself because it makes us unique. And we don't have to be right about beauty, right? It can just be. So I can find something really beautiful. You can find it ugly or somewhere in between. And that can be okay. That is freedom too, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And you say that beauty has only really been a value for you in the last few years. I would say probably maybe consciously, mm -hmm. but as a musician, I think beauty has been there at your heart for your entire life. I know, I know. I used to play the harp. I mean, what could be more beautiful, right? 
Yeah, so that's a really typical example of being led by your desires. So I had this, well, I discovered the heart when I was four. I was sitting in a theater watching Swan Lake and suddenly this harp came in. I thought, what is that? I've never heard anything as beautiful as that. And I just, I let that harp guide the whole first part of my life. I just followed like, the thread of the heart where it led me. And of course, you, you're telling me now, and you're right, Amy, that this was beauty also. It was one form of beauty. There are many forms of beauty. And I'm sure we can find people who say, oh, the heart, oh, that's dreadful, right? And that is okay. I don't need to be right about it. No, and it, I mean, I'm thinking about all the poets in the world, all, all the artists in the world, all the sculptors in the world, in terms of over history, all these people have seen beauty in very different forms. And it's a really important part of, of our, us as humanity and purpose, I believe. So it's not superficial at all. It, it runs to our core. Mm, I'm so glad you're saying that. Yeah, it just gives me confirmation. But um, I couldn't agree more. Mm. So tell me, this guide, this thread that's led you, do you feel as though something is, is pulling you towards something or are you being pushed away from something or is it just a case of you're in control uh, totally now? Uh, I'm never in control of very much <laughs> and I enjoy that. So I'm perfectly fine with not being in control what I do have a lot of trust in myself, so I know that I can deal with anything that comes my way. So that feels, well, that's my safety blanket, really. And I think it's important for us to feel safe. And I feel very safe, not knowing what will happen in five minutes, in one hour, yesterday, tomorrow, you know, that is all good for me. But um, I think it's because I trust myself, really. And I can understand how my clients, they feel that, it's fearful, uncertainty is fearful because they don't know how they will react to it. But then once we work on how they can react to it, how you can actually choose how you want to react, well then most things don't seem very fearful anymore, but I'm not answering your question at all, I think. No, I think you are, it's great. It's, it, we're talking about the, the control and, and about this thread that's been guiding you and, and what you, touched on there and you mentioned earlier is this trust this trusting of self again and from an early age you've trusted your 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 feeling your gut feeling that that is the way to go and then now with decades of of it's come true and you've you've made things happen obviously it's it's coupled trust is coupled with action taking yes of course <laughs> Of course, it depends really. Well, I think you can take action from, from a sort of proving energy or you can take action from desire. And your question is coming back to me because you said, are you pushed by suffering or are you pulled by desire in some, some ways? So I was pushed to leave Denmark from suffering because I was very unhappy. Uh, not because there was any reason to be unhappy, but you know how you are when you're a teenager. So <laughs> I was very unhappy with life and myself and very disappointed in myself. So that was enough to push me to, towards my desires, really. But then with age, as you say, I've come to realize that I don't need the suffering I can leave that whole suffering piece on the on the side and just move towards my desire. So right now I desire living in a chateau here in France. So I don't, I mean, I'm not suffering now. I live in a beautiful, very old mansion in, in southern France, and that's all very good. I can enjoy that every day, but I'm allowed to have desires. And my next desire doesn't have to be justified by present suffering. I can just choose it. I can choose, let me discover the most gorgeous shadow I've ever seen and let me move into it. And let me have lots of inspiring people come around 
and share it with me. Do you see what I mean? Absolutely. And my goodness, you know, who doesn't want to choose living in a chateau in France? I, I absolutely love that. But it, it, you've created this life of purpose, this it's not just happened by coincidence. It's been crafted over years. And and this is what I believe with purpose is that you don't just find it. You 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 actually take steps towards it and it is very much something that you build. Yes. And I think everybody would agree with that. You have to take steps towards it. But I think what is really stopping most people is that it can be so daunting. It can be, it can seem so difficult, overwhelming, fearful, and then you're always running the risk of being disappointed, aren't you? And then what if you were to feel disappointment? It would probably kill you, wouldn't it? So you better just stay close. Of course, I'm joking, but we do sort of prevent ourselves from living our full lives because of the emotions we want to avoid feeling. I believe. But if we were just okay with feeling those feelings, well, then nothing could stop us, really. So you, you were talking earlier that you don't need the suffering. So is that an emotion that you are avoiding feeling or are you consciously parking it? I think that as a musician, you work with your feelings and you can conjure up whatever feeling in an instant because you use it for your interpretations. So in real life, I don't enjoy suffering, but I would say in art, I can enjoy suffering. Do you see what I mean? Suffering is very, very useful because it can, it can spur us onto action, the action you were talking about. It can spur us on to take action towards our purpose, but we don't want to stay there, right? We want to be able to feel it, not to wallow in it, but to give us that, that spark that will have us move in the right direction. So suffering, I love listening to the most heart-wrenching music. I love watching films that really, that wring my heart. But I don't really aspire to feeling any suffering in my day-to-day -day life, if you see what I mean. I totally understand. So tell me, what does focus on why mean to you? It means that I'm clear about why I get up in the morning. Right? I know that I can help people. I, help, I know that beauty is part of it. I know that if I can get in front of people and let them know that they too can have a purpose and they are allowed to move towards it. They don't have to justify the why, they can just have the why, right? Because sometimes we feel we have to explain why or we have to justify the action we're taking. But if we just drop that whole thing and just allow the why to be, I can be very conscious that when I sit down at my desk to work, I know that my why is to relieve suffering in this world. I believe I can heal, help heal people through sharing the beauty of who they really are. So I'm holding up a mirror so people can see how rich and, and gorgeous they really are. And I think that in and of itself is healing. And this mirror, physical, metaphorical? Metaphorical. I think... Self-awareness will heal anything, right? If you're open to being self-aware, if you can come to that self-awareness with compassion instead of judgment, then I think we can only be richer as a society from everybody knowing themselves even better. So tell me, Katrine, this beautiful purpose that you hold very close to your heart this moving from Denmark to the United Kingdom to to France is there another destination Ooh, apart from my chateau not that I'm aware of but we are learning Italian with my husband so who knows 
I, I'm not sure. I think if I hadn't married a French person, um, I would probably have moved on from France. And I think it could have, could have been Italy, but it could have been Sweden too. I mean, we did talk about moving to Sweden at some point, but then we got a chalet in the Alps and a boat. And so, you know, we can only be in so many places in one year. So, yeah, I don't need to know. I just know that at the moment, my focus is my chateau. I think it would be toward more, more in the north of France, really. Um, but I don't really know anything else. I'm just, that is where I'm moving towards. Love it. So tell me, anybody who'd like to get in contact with you, Katrine, what would they need to do? How would they find you? Well, they can go and meet me on my website, which is katrinahorn.com. So K-A-T-R-I-N-E-H-O-R-N.com. And well, they can either just write me an email or if they want to, they can book a consult and we'll get to meet up on Zoom. Or they can download a meditation or watch a workshop or anything else they desire. And I always love connecting with people, really, and hearing their stories, the way that you are sharing so many inspiring stories with the world. I love hearing other people's stories, too. And that's really how I found you. Fabulous. Tell me, your meditations, do you include your own music? Um, no. And I've often wondered why. <laughs> so I have done a bit of heart playing sort of meditative, meditatively, but I wouldn't call it my music. The music I used to love play was French Impressionist music. And that is just far too exciting to be meditating on, I find. <laughs> Oh, brilliant. I just I just found it would be really lovely to have the I could just really imagine a meditation with very calming harp music. It'd be really mm. lovely. But yes, yeah. but that would sort of be, yeah, I have done that, but it's not like when I listen to music, I can't have background music because my brain is just 100 percent engaged with that music. So I'm either listening to music or I'm having a conversation or I'm doing whatever. I'm not doing both. Right. So having that sort of um, attention craving music going on in the background is nothing for me. So on my meditations, there's often nature sounds or uh, instrument sounds, but there are no melodies or something that your brain wants to latch onto, if you see what I mean. I do. And I just want to pick up on that just just as an aside, because whenever I need to concentrate, I listen to piano music. Uh, classical piano music and that is my go-to right focus Amy on the task ahead and mm. it really does help and there's some music that I can't listen to very and I can't listen to anything with any lyrics because it does distract me so it has to be classical and I love listening to Lang Lang which is just um, uh, yeah. absolutely gorgeous yeah. so I have that on repeat and it's, I don't know what it is but it does put me into a a very focused state yeah, but imagine me as a musician. Music is as if he was speaking words. Like I get that. it. I understand. Yeah. Okay, so I'm only listening from a very superficial level, but it helps me to concentrate. No. <laughs> I think also perhaps you've got that very useful um, trigger. Like right, yeah. There's a famous author who wrote tons and tons of detective stories, I think it was, or spy stories. I can't remember his name in the moment. But his routine was to go up into the attic where his office was in the morning and start writing. So before nine o'clock in the morning, he had already written so many hundred words. And I know that Debussy too went to a particular room in his house, looked out of the window, saw uh, the steeple outside the window, and that would trigger his creativity, right? So I think it's perhaps a question of triggering um, your creativity or your focusness or whatever you would call it. You know, you've got some outside triggers that put you in that state of mind, which is gorgeous. Yeah, lovely. I, I'm going to have to find out which of that, which author you are speaking to. You'll have to let me know so that I can find <laughs> out. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. So again, my goodness, Katrina, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been 
a beauty, an absolute beauty. Speaking about beauty and freedom and purpose and all of the gorgeous work that you're doing, it really is. And I really look forward to reflecting on this conversation and listening back to to what you shared from the perspective of of a of a listener, not just as a host, and and just sharing some different things in my reflections and actions. But do you have any final words for the audience, please? I would leave. I would love to imprint on whoever's listening's mind that they are actually in charge, right? If they could just trust themselves, really trust themselves to, to believe that what they want is possible, just nurturing that belief, that can really move mountains. Because once you believe, most of the time, then you're willing to take the action you were talking about, the action that you need to take to get to where it is you want to be. How has this conversation had an impact on you? What value have you received from tuning in? What are your reflections with actions? Please take a moment to leave me an Apple podcast or Spotify review sharing how Focus on Why has made a difference to you today. Remember, the conversation doesn't end here. To keep it going, simply connect with me on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook or Twitter or join the Focus on Why Facebook group. All the links are in the show notes. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why.